One of the things I think that's really destabilizing our society right now maybe is that I'm not sure that kids have been encouraged or allowed to play enough in the last 25, 30 years. And I think a lot of this identity stuff is actually fantasy play. It's delayed fantasy play because it's sort of what you do when you're seven years old. It's like, well, I'm going to be this identity. That's what you're doing when you pretend. You're going to go along with that because we're going to play this out. It's like, that's fine. You don't impose that though, right? Not, not if you're a kid that has a clue. You invite people to play. You don't insist on your identity and their compliance with it. It's not a playable game. And you don't burst into tears and run off when someone won't play your game because then they won't play with you. And then you have to turn to force. And that's, that's fine if that's what you want to do, but you better look out because you better be ready to use it. Um, does creating a universal morality come with the responsibility of making sure it's applied universally? And what I mean by this is if we can say belief structure A is better than belief structure B from a pragmatic perspective, does it come with the responsibility of making sure that people who are trapped perhaps in a tradical belief structure in somewhere else, do we have a responsibility against that? Good question. I mean, that, that's part of the question that, that I, in some sense, motivated, in some sense, motivated the American in incursion into Iraq, right? So what's our responsibility in relationship to tyranny? That's a good question. Because uh, one of the criticisms current feminists are getting is for not protesting about the situation of women in, say, Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think, that's, I think that criticism is more emerging because, of, because it's apparently it's apparently paradoxical. I mean, they've laid out a set of principles to which, in principle, they, they adhere. And one of those principles is to reduce the destructive power of the patriarchy. It's like, okay, there's some destructive patriarchy for you. Radio silence. It's like, hmm, now what am I supposed to do about that? Am I supposed to question your adherence to those principles? Which is exactly what should be done. So I think it's a, it's, it's a, it's a criticism of performative contradiction. You say you're for this, but when it comes to act it out, you don't selectively in this situation. So there's something wrong, there's something about your game that you're not being straight about. That's the criticism. And maybe there's rejoinders to that, you know. But, well, okay, okay, well, responsibility. Well, you know, then you'd have to look at it at different levels of, of analysis with regards to interaction. You definitely have a responsibility to your partner and your children. Okay, so your responsibility to your children, as far as I'm concerned, is don't, it's twofold. One, don't let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. And there's a corollary to that, which is don't be an idiot. You know, so that's partly why you need a partner, because your partner has to tell you when your demands on your children are excessive, because you're kind of, you know, you're not 100% oriented properly. But still, you're their target adult, and so it's up to you to help them choose a path that makes you want them to be around. Right, it's, and that, that's your critical responsibility. And hopefully, you're enough of an, an analog of the broader community, so that if they can figure out how to get along with you, it radically increases the probability that they'll be able to get along with everyone. So for example, if you're playing with your children, two years old, you, you help them, you encourage them to play in a manner that's fun. And if you get that down, then, you know, when you introduce them to another child, don't know how to play in a manner that's fun. And so, great, you've, you've solved the problem. The problem is to get your child to enter into the collaborative social world. And so, yes, you have a primary responsibility for that. And then with regards to your partner, here's something to think about with regards to roles. So, my wife and I have had this discussion many times, and one of the discussions is, well, how are we to treat each other in public? And it isn't, her name is Tammy, the discussion isn't how should Jordan treat Tammy in public or how should Tammy treat Jordan. That's not the discussion. This isn't personal. It's how should a wife treat her husband and how should a husband treat his wife. It's impersonal. And it's partly, you don't put your partner down in public. Why? Well, it's not because you're hurting that person's feelings. That's not why. It's that you're denigrating the relationship that you are in voluntarily. You know, and I've, some of the most painful days I've ever spent, one in particular I spent with a group of men who had been in therapy for their marriage and who bloody well needed it, I can tell you that. 
and they spent their whole day complaining about their wives. Like, it just made me sweat the whole day. I thought, I can't believe I'm here with you guys. I, I, I can't tell you why I was. It's, it's, you know, it was just happenstance more than anything. And I thought, how can you be so damn dumb? It's like, it's certainly possible that you married, barbar married barbarian witches. Fine. But you don't have, you, you're so lacking in sense that you would discuss that in public. Not noticing that you picked them. So basically all you're doing is holding up a sign and waving it constantly that says, I'm an idiot, I'm an idiot, right? And so, well, back to responsibility. You have a responsibility to those whom you love and are obligated to, to ensure that they manifest themselves in a manner that's most beneficial to them over the long run. Now, you have the same responsibility, I would say, to yourself, but you'll have blind spots. Other people have to help you with that. But so the rule is, you know, you don't let, you don't, you help your wife figure out how not to make a fool of herself in public. And she extends to you the same courtesy. And it's partly maintenance of the sacred nature of the relationship. It has nothing to do with you or her, precisely. It's broader and wider than that. Okay, so then that's two levels of responsibility. Child, partner, next level of responsibility. <coughs> You're asked at your workplace to, go to undergo unconscious bias retraining. And you say yes. It's like, okay, you've just admitted that you're a bigot, right? Because you're acting it out. It's like, I'm a racist bigot, obviously I need to be retrained. And so you might say, well, I'm not going to make a fuss about it, right? Or I've been told to do it. Or maybe you agree with it, fine. And if, that, if you agree with it, no problem. You can make a case for it. I think it's a weak and appalling case, personally. But you can make a case for it. You could say, well, you know, I am interested in my, uh, my biases and how to rectify them. And, like, fair enough, you know, people are biased. But if you object to it and you don't say anything, then you're complicit. And then it's on you. And you know, like, A causes B and C, and B causes C and D, and so forth. The thing tends, it doesn't always, but it has this tendency to expand. And you'll come home angry and upset, and you'll go to the training program, and you'll think this is ridiculous, because that is what you'll think in all likelihood, and you won't say anything. But it eats at you. Well, you've abrogated your responsibility. And so, and then you might say, well, so then, then that's how the community becomes corrupt. That's how the community starts to be corrupt, is that people turn a blind eye to emergent pathology when they know it's pathological. That's exactly what the Egyptian story says. Osiris is overcome by Seth because he's willfully blind. Willfully blind, which means he knows, but refuses to, he knows, quote, his predator detection systems have gone off. Monster. Well, then you're supposed to look, okay, exactly what sort of monster is this? Well, it doesn't have wings, it doesn't have a tail, you know? You cut it down into the, you cut it from the monster that it could be into the monster that it is. That's the first step. And then you take the appropriate steps. And then you also notice the other monsters, because here's something to think about. You're going to pay a price for speaking up. But you're going to pay a price for not speaking up. So it's like monsters on the right, monsters on the left. Pick the ones you want to battle with. If you decide not to make your stand, you weaken yourself. If you do it a hundred times, then even if the monster was only this big, now you're this big, it's going to eat you. You know, when it was this big, you probably could have kicked it across the room. It's too late for that. You've capitulated and capitulated. You know, and so what, what you've done, and this is a way to think about it from a Jungian perspective, this is what Jung was trying to get at when he was talking about al alchemy. It's like, the thing that pops up to object to you is this incredibly complex entity. It's, it's the entire world encapsulated in the event. Um, if you interact with it, you unpack it, you differentiate your sense of the world, and, you, and you, you gather new skills. So for example, let's say there's something going on at your workplace and, it, and you need to object to it because it's driving you crazy, and you talk it over with your wife so that you've got your head screwed on straight. You say, oh, I've got to say something. And you go there and you say something and you know, you're stumbling and awkward and all of that, but, but you watch the response. 
And maybe you get what you're aiming at, maybe you don't, but you've learned a bunch. You've learned, well, I'm not as coherent as I could be. I'm not as good at putting my arguments together. My boss is more of a son of a bitch than, I, than he thought he was. This is a worse problem than I knew about. It's like differentiated, differentiated. So now the landscape is higher resolution, and so are you. Well, so good, so maybe you're a little bit next, better prepared the next time you have to do that. And so the issue here, to some degree, is don't lose an opportunity to grapple with something that objects to you, especially when the object, objection is rather small. Because that's something you can, you say, well, I can put up with it. It's like, fair enough, like you don't want to make everything into a war. I usually use a rule of three. If we're interacting and you do something that I find disruptive, I'll, I'll note it. It's like, potential dragon, gone. And I leave it be. And then if you do it again, I think, oh yeah, that probably wasn't merely situational, but I'll leave it be, because that's still not enough evidence. But if you do it a third time, then I'll say, hey, I just noticed this. And you'll say, no, that didn't happen. And I'll say, yeah, not only did it happen, but it happened here, and it happened here, and I'm not making this up. So there's something going on here, like, I'm not ignoring it, and we can get to the bottom of it. And then they'll come up with a bunch of objections about why that isn't necessary, and you push those aside, and they'll come up with a few more objections, and they'll push those aside, and then usually they'll get mad or burst into tears, and if you push that aside, then you get to have a conversation. Right, and then you can solve the problem, but man, it's, you gotta be a monster, because first of all, you need six arguments about why their objections aren't gonna stop you, and then you have to not be intimidated by the anger, and you have to not be swamped by compassion about the tears. And then you can have a conversation. And people don't do that. They won't do that. And so they don't solve the problems. And so then the problems accrue. Right? And if they accrue over 15 years of a relationship, they end up, then they end up fat, ugly, and in divorce court. So, and that's, you know, that's not a, that's not a great outcome. It's a, it's, divorce court and cancer are, similar in their, in their seriousness. Not always, but, but sufficiently often. So when that error emerges, it's a, it's a glimmering 